In the summer, it's really clear. You need to water fruit trees, especially newly planted fruit trees. But how frequently do you need to water them? And do you need to water fruit trees in the fall when the leaves are already starting to look a little old and they're about to fall to the ground for the winter? In this little video, I'm going to talk to Kevin Folta, who is a professor of horticulture at the University of Florida, and he's going to tell me all about it. So let's dig in. Let's say that you and I just planted a tree today, a little baby tree. The roots are now in the ground. Maybe it was a bare root tree. What do you need to keep in mind? A bare root tree will be different than one that shows up in a pot and one that's still moving with some soil because roots in a perfect world have a very intimate association with soil particles. That soil is a matrix that has uh, little spaces in between. And those little spaces between soil hold water and they hold oxygen and, and lots of other goodies that, that plants want and need. And so plants will make these really nice associations. It's why when you take a plant out of a pot that's in soil, it holds on to the soil. And it's got little tiny, the surface area of the little root hairs and grabbing soil or touching soil particles is massive. And uh, so when you're putting a bare root tree, it's a little bit different because you don't have those fine, that fine root structure. You're putting that tree in the ground, bare roots, dormant tree, no leaves, and then letting those roots grow and those root hairs and those root association form. And that's why we need to be really cognizant of watering during this period because the, all of the major uptake mechanisms have been really compromised. And that's when you get that the phenomenon of transplantation shock. You're breaking the association with roots. So you keep things really wet, really saturated for the first a couple of days or weeks, just in order to facilitate that transition. So here we are, we've got our little bare root tree, we're watering it. How will you know when that that the tree is ready to be left on its own? Almost a universal thing I've learned with trees is they don't establish for a long time. They're not fully established really for three years, but that first year is the most critical. And as it starts to put roots out and you start to uh, get elongation that's happening under the soil surface, uh, it tends to be in the top six inches to two feet of soil column that you have radial growth from the tree out. And it typically extends to the drip line and then usually two to four times out beyond the drip line. So roots are doing a couple things. You're, you have these uh, finer roots that are in the top of the soil column. We usually refer to them, or they are referred to casually as feeder roots, but they're actually the root hairs of the roots that are going out, um, non-woody roots. Then you have roots that are there strictly for anchorage and those that are going really deep but versus those that are lateral for anchorage. So roots have a number of different functions. It's the ones that are in that top portion of the column, of the soil column, that are doing all of the scavenging for water. And they actually have hydro, hydrotropic growth. They actually will move towards water, but also oxygen. Oxygen is really critical for root metabolism and for that uh, to be present. So that's another part of it. The soil needs to have water in between the soil particles, but it also needs air. And that sounds like a contradiction because once you fill up that soil with water, how is the air going to get in? Water uh, moves very easily by capillary action. So if you think about a paper towel that you dip into a puddle, you can hold the end of the paper towel up over the puddle in your hand and it'll eventually draw up. A lot of something very similar is happening. Water molecules adhere to each other by very minor electrostatic interactions, which are the basis of why water is so magical. The water interacts with other water molecules. And so this idea of adhesion and cohesion and movement into uh, by capillary action is what's happening. This is what's happening inside the plant. As water transpires off the leaves, the roots are absorbing more water from inside. For every water molecule that goes off the top, one comes in the bottom. And there's other issues where roots create pressure to push water up as well. But as you're pulling the water out of the soil, you're now pulling air down into where the water was. So you actually are displacing the water with air. And so it helps me to understand that fruit trees need water, 
but they also need to dry out between irrigation sessions. And that's the trick, because if we're so excited about watering and we water our tree every day, just in case it needs the water, we actually may be doing more harm than good. Exactly. No, yeah. Water um, is a blessing and a curse. And uh, most plants have a Goldilocks zone that they like to live in. Uh, some can tolerate a little more moist soils. But in general, keeping it where it dries out between waterings is not a bad idea. It really does help facilitate uh, a, the, the plant's defenses against uh, pathogens, but also encourages the roots to go and continue to grow and search for more water. Okay, so recently I was in Austin, Texas, and I visited a very beautiful food forest. And the team was out, they were doing their watering, and they had planted some new pawpaw trees. So they're watering in those pawpaw trees. How long will they need to continue watering those trees? And this is a special case because pawpaws are weird. I, In my experience, pawpaws are very difficult to establish that their roots damage easily upon transplantation and they require watering very frequently, but not too much. They, they're one with a very thin Goldilocks zone that tolerates, they don't dr tolerate drying out, but they also don't like being too wet. Avocados uh, don't like being too wet. There's a lot of plants that really like to keep their feet dry and, but they require water. So pawpaws, I think, You'll be watering for a while, at least a year with some regular watering. And, and, and some folks make the mistake of saying, well, put five gallons of water every week. It really is a question of the soil moisture and actually testing how does the soil feel in terms of its moisture level. And if it feels dry to the touch or dusty, or dry, it's too dry. It, but at the same time, keep in mind that these are uh, interactions that are happening at the molecular level, cellular molecular level. I think it's important just to understand your soil from the standpoint of understanding what you're trying to grow in. Where I grow trees on one of our orchards, there's one spot that's just sugar sand. And it's to the point where grass doesn't even like growing in it water goes right through it, very low organic matter. It's absolutely horrible. And we don't really grow much there. Other places, it's rather rich and actually quite rich in uh, organic matter and does well. But for me, the best thing to do for anybody in terms of advice is take a pot, a flower pot, good, nice three, five gallon one, and fill it with the soil that's from your space and water it and uh, let it settle for a few weeks. Let it just do what it does. Let it sprout some weeds, whatever. And then water it again and pay attention to where the water moves through it. Because water is a lot like electricity. And in terms of its flow, it likes a path of least resistance. And you may think that you're irrigating and applying enough water so that's saturating the soil, when really it's just finding one little finger and moving through that one space, leaving most of it unwatered. So you have to really get an idea of the dynamics of your soil and how it percolates water through it. And it's usually fun to do that bucket test because it really does help you understand how your soil in particular gets watered. The other quick point is when you irrigate, take a look and see how deep the water goes. Because if you're using, whether it's a hose or whether you're using microjets, you'd be surprised how little water actually soaks in. I can water a you know, pot for a while and it's just on the top centimeter or two. It doesn't go in like we think it does. And that's because it finds these alternative routes through the soil. I'm growing in a cooler climate. Soon the leaves will fall off the trees. At some point there's going to be snow. I don't have to water during the winter, do I? No, usually it's fine to not worry about it. As the ground freezes, there's not as much water loss from the plant. So what's on board usually stays on board unless you get wind. We can think of examples of different evergreens and things that have freeze dried in, in very cold windstorms unprotected, especially those that haven't established yet. But in general, trees are pretty good at protecting themselves during winter. Now let's talk about fall watering a more mature tree, maybe a tree that's been there for 10 years. It's had a good summer of water. It's produced a harvest. It's not really as busy as it was during the growing season. It's not <laughs> pushing the water into the fruit. It's not creating new leaves and maybe it's not even photosynthesizing that much at this point does it still need watering yeah it still does need water and and it's a good idea to give it some to you draw back 
quite a bit and don't give as much as the days get shorter. The, like you say, that there's fewer demands. The tree is now doing the rest of the photosynthesis is going into establishing next year's buds. It's also translocating more flow material to the roots. Those are the two main things that are happening during this time. As the leaves go away, less water is warranted because there's less transpiration. You're losing less water from the leaf surfaces. So that tree is, think of it as a full glass. Maybe you lose a little bit here and there, but in general, you can really dial back on, on watering. Awesome. Okay, so there we've got our mature tree. In terms of where we put the water, let's talk about that for a mature tree. Like when it's a, a newly planted little bare root tree or even a potted tree, you know where the roots are because you just planted it. And you know you want to get the water near where the roots are. So the water may be closer to the trunk as the tree grows older and those roots expand outwards. So where do we put those soaker hoses or drip <laughs> irrigation or watering can? Where do we do that? Generally, anywhere outside around the drip line and then extending out for a few meters is usually where all of the best uptake is. The good news is, is that even if those are under grass or under, under other ground cover, you still do get enough water that percolates through from either irrigation or from rain to allow that to at least give the tree enough of what it needs. And typically, if you remove all of the other competing vegetation, whether it's grass or whether it's lawn or whatever, uh, remove that to the drip line and maybe a little bit beyond and then mulch it. The mulch will really help retain the soil moisture. And down here in Florida, if you don't mulch, uh, the soil bakes so solid that when you do get water, it just forms a bead and rolls off. It doesn't even soak in. So mulching is really pivotal to keeping evaporation down, but uh, also to help ensure soaking it, that water that you do apply gets in. We're talking about micro jet versus drip hose, it is some sort of drip system. And with a drip system, you've got like this little tiny hose and a little bit of water comes up and it drips, but it comes out so slowly. Isn't the idea that when it goes into the soil, it somehow stretches and pushes outwards, like you explained before, that paper towel effect. And why would microjet be better? Yeah, so drip is okay. Drip is, in, in terms of conservation, drip is awesome. You can't beat it because it puts the water in one spot and that water percolates in the soil. It either is going to move down through that column, depending upon the soil type. So we have in Florida, nice sand where the water goes in and it goes straight down. <laughs> you can put dyes in water and see where the dye goes and it doesn't go this way. It goes that way. And, but as you have more silt and other organic matter that's in the soil, you'll see more lateral movement of water in the soil column. So up where you are in your soil, you probably have very good lateral translocation of water. That, and then that will also uh, follow roots and uh, adhere to roots and move along roots by adhesion and cohesion. It'll move along those surfaces uh, and be picked up by those tiny little root hairs, those little feeder roots that are on the edges of, of the main root structures. So drip can work in certain soil types really well. Where I'm at, you have to use microjet. So you're just, you're sending a fan of water over a area and then letting that soak in. And that means we have to remove more vegetation and use more mulching. Okay. So now let's dig into competition with grass and, and those related issues. So we talked about, and I certainly favor removing the grass up to the edge of the canopy. So in our orchard park, we get these big, beautiful mulch circles that come and get bigger every year. And I'm good with it. It looks beautiful. But there is other practices. There are other practices that once a tree is slightly more mature, people will plant things like strawberries. It's more of a permaculture. Everybody supports everybody else or nearby shrubs and things like that. How does that affect this whole situation? In general, as long as you're giving more water than your competitor needs, that water is going to percolate through and get to those roots. They're going to be saying, they're going to be sharing the same space. So the strawberry roots, for instance, would be in the same general place as the tree roots. Maybe the tree roots be a little bit lower, but in general, they work in that same zone. 
So they're competing for the same water. As long as you have a little bit excess, it's okay. Any other suggestions that you have for growers? I, I think the idea of just knowing your soil type, knowing your plants needs, and really becoming very familiar with how those needs are met by the environment that's there. So what's happening with rain, working with the rain that's available, usually only watering when necessary. But a couple other fun things that are becoming more and more of a possibility is uh, automating your your watering. And this way uh, you're out of the equation. You're not standing there with a hose or a watering can putting on too much. You're letting the micro jet do it when the micro jet needs to do it. And then you can uh, even install electronics now that will cut off the water after there's a rainfall so that you are cut, cut off the, uh, the electric signal to the solenoid after a uh, rainfall. So you can put in very elaborate systems for very little money now that will run themselves. And that's nice because it takes the error out of it and it, it tends to allow you to focus on the plant and on the soil and not standing there with a hose. Is there any company or website that I can share with people to learn more about that kind of approach? Wow, there's nothing that I can recommend off the top of my head, but I am going to, to put together a YouTube video on this. I build my own systems with a solar panel and each one costs under 50 bucks and runs big sections of trees. So it's a very easy system to build and very nice because I hear the water run in the morning. I can hear it going through the pipes and I'm not doing anything. So it makes it a much easier system to manage, especially when you have a lot of trees. Oh my gosh, Kevin, you have to share that video with me and I will share it with my students and people on YouTube uh, who are watching this video. Yeah, we'll do. Yeah, I'll definitely get on it because it needed to happen a long time ago and it needs to happen now. It's, it's such an easy thing to do and you can buy a system or have someone install it for you and pay a lot of money for it. This is all very simple to do. So I'll be sure to do it. Thank you. Please do. I'm waiting. <laughs> Thanks so much for this chat today. Thank you very much.